Good morning, Oz. Good morning, Richard. How are you today? I am great. <laughs> How are you? Not, not bad at all. Cheers. So it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to have you uh, on today. You're one of the all-time leaders in your variety of fields. Um, for those that don't know who you are, Richard, um, how would you describe yourself uh, when people ask you what you do? I always say that I am an investor and uh, a writer, an author, uh, which is largely true. So that's that's what I do. I, I have been an entrepreneur once in the sense that I was actually part of co-founder of a consulting business. Uh, and I like to describe myself as an entrepreneur, but it's not really true because the people who are doing the hard work are the people who are actually uh, running a company. So I do the easier thing, which is to um, to select and invest in uh, companies. But I'm a very active investor, a very uh, close uh, colleague in a way of the people who are actually running the business. Uh, not that I get in their way, but I do think about the business and talk to them about it. And so I think that's a very, um, it's a very gratifying thing to be able to do that occasionally. And uh, those guys, all the guys who are running my companies, I'd like to dedicate this uh, podcast to them. Unreasonable success and how to achieve it. Unreasonable, Brilliant. not reasonable success, unreasonable what? success. Unreasonable success, fantastic. And, and, and now, over the years, I've been pretty happy with Earl Nightingale's definition that success is the progression of a worthy ideal. But building on that, and the title of your new book, Richard, how would you define unreasonable success? Actually, I've got a definition at the beginning of the, the book. Um, I put a fake dictionary definition in and it has four meanings, unreasonable success. Mm. Um, and I'll see if I can remember what, what the four meanings are. Uh, unreasonable success usually has all four attributes or at least three of them. <clears throat> and the first one is such success in changing the world but it might seem unreasonable for any individual to have such impact. Mm. I've always been struck Oz, by the amazing fact that individuals can make such a huge difference at, at a grand level or at a micro level as well. And that seems to me to be the unique glory of our species. So it's the impact of individuals and unreasonable success means that some people, for whatever reason, and I explore the reasons in the book, have a degree of impact on their world, which might be good impact or bad impact or indeed morally uh, indifferent impact, but nevertheless can achieve a fantastic amount. Obviously, not many people do this, but mm. it fascinates me when they do. So that's the first definition. The second is success that's unexpected and was not predicted early in the career of the individual. And yeah. one, one of the amazing things, I, I've selected 20 people in the book that uh, I think changed the world in some way. And those 20 people, uh, almost none of them were, um, were favoured in terms of their background. There were, there were actually two who were. But the other 18 came from nowhere. And what interests me is, you know, why are people who don't start with a great background or, you know, come from obscurity, why are they successful? How do they manage to become successful? After they become successful, it appears to be inevitable, but of course it wasn't. Uh, and so that's another important aspect of, of unreasonable success. Thirdly, Success that goes well, I love this one, success that goes well beyond what the individual's skills and performance seem to warrant. Mm. You know, I don't believe that successful people really deserve their success. In a, in, of course, in some ways they do. Uh, and every successful person, almost every successful person, uh, believes that they're successful because they're a genius and they're wonderful and all the rest of it. If you actually study the history of any really remarkably successful person, you see that there are what appear to be huge elements of luck and chance in their careers. And they often get a break in their career that, that couldn't have been expected, couldn't have been planned, uh, but which makes all the difference. Uh, one of the things which, which 
does amaze me is that it's not about performance. And I think that's very hopeful for everyone. It's not about our performance. The people who were uh, incredibly successful who are in my book, with one or two exceptions, they, they actually were not as good in many ways on conventional criteria as their peers. They were not as competent, they were not as brilliant, right. and, and so on and so forth. But somehow, and that's the mystery of the book, somehow they were successful almost beyond what they deserved, if you want to put it that way. And then the fourth attribute, which I think is hugely important, is that their success was all based on leaps of intuition rather than on logic and reason. In other words, they were lucky because they were highly intuitive. And um, that is uh, something which I explore in the book. And intuition is not random, though. Uh, intuition comes from a deep knowledge of a very narrow sphere, usually. And there are various other attributes of intuition. Using one's unconscious mind to the full um, is, is the key to that, I think. And there are examples in the book of people who were uh, incredibly gifted because they were intuitive, not because they were... They were brilliant. Uh, Albert Einstein's one of those, actually. I mean, everyone thinks he defines genius. Well, you know, when you look at his um, school record, it wasn't very good indeed. Uh, you know, early on, he was very weak in mathematics. You'd think to be a brilliant physicist, you'd need to be a genius at, uh, at maths. Uh, Albert's maths were very poor, and he relied on his girlfriend, his, uh, effectively his wife, to help him with um, his mathematical calculations. He failed to get into the Polytechnic in Zurich uh, on his first attempt. And the Polytechnic was by no means the best school in Zurich. So, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. He, the, the genius of um, Einstein was the leaps of imagination which he made. And there were very good reasons for that. They were not random. But the, the, the intuition is often part of the answer in explaining why people who on the face of it shouldn't have been very successful actually were. Sorry if that's a long definition, to, no, long no. answer to your short question. No, p perfect. So, you know, I'm, go I'm going to move on to the subtitle of the book, and I think you've, you've answered um, some components of this next question. So the subtitle of the book is How to Achieve It, and without giving too much of the book away, what are the key characteristics, habits, and attributes that make individuals unreasonable, unreasonably successful based on your research? So, you know, serendipity was there, leaps of intuition were there. Yes, I mean, it's a book about individual success. And I was mm. sort of fascinated by, um, in fact, put onto this by uh, Malcolm Gladwell, another uh, more eminent author, a more successful author than me, but he wrote a book called Outliers. And he tries to explain why individuals are so successful. And that's my mission as well. And he came mm. up with a theory, which is an, an interesting theory, and which definitely works in some cases, which was that these people who were successful very early in their career were exposed to a huge amount of experience in a fast growing new field. And so, for example, he takes the Beatles as, as an example, and he says that they were a mediocre high school group, effectively, in Liverpool. But what happened to them was that they happened to go to the strip clubs of Hamburg, and they had to play seven days a week for eight hours a day. And so they accumulated a huge amount of experience in the new emerging field of rock and roll music or pop music mutating from um, rock and roll. And um, he quotes John Lennon, who says, we, we couldn't help getting better because we played so much and we had so much mm. experience. And he takes the case of Bill Gates, who happened to go to a posh school in America where they had a computer at the time that nobody else had computers. And uh, he spent hours and hours on the computer and therefore learned how to code it and learned about software and, and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And that... Uh, from that, he drew out the thesis that you need 10,000 hours of experience, which is sort of basically <laughs> 10 years works worth in a new expanding field. The trouble with the, 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 that explanation is it doesn't work for a lot of cases. 
Yep. And so, Agreed. so my challenge was, can I come up with something which does work in the vast majority of cases? Now, I had to qualify it and say that I was talking not just about success, but about uh, a high degree of success, unreasonable success, which makes it a bit easier. Um, and what I did was to go through the cases of all of the very, very successful people whose life stories I knew very well, either because for one reason or another, I'd learned quite a bit about them, I was fascinated by them, or in some cases, because I actually knew them. And so what I did was to say, what, what were the, the reasons that these, perhaps in many cases, unpromising people actually were so successful? And I went through about 30 or 40 reasons, possible reasons. And if it didn't work for nearly all of these 20 people or for all of them, I discarded it. And then I was left with nine attributes, which um, I made a little map out of. And I, I sort of imagined that they were visiting these landmarks, like being on a treasure hunt or something like that. And um, so I came up with these nine um, landmarks. And then each chapter in the book, in the main part of the book, is actually devoted to one of these landmarks. And the landmarks really fall into two different types of category. There are mm. what I call the attitude issues, which are not conventional uh, you know, everyone says that you should be positive and all the rest of it. No, it's much more specific than that. Um, um, for example, self-belief, absolutely crucial. You know, for some reason, these people, rightly or wrongly, and in many cases, really wrongly, came to acquire mm. a very high degree of self-belief. It didn't happen immediately. It wasn't something they were born with in most cases. But somehow, because of the way that they... Um, figured the world worked and somehow because of some experiences that they had or maybe just because they were very unusual sort of people they came to have a very high degree of self-belief and in the book I explore you know how it's possible for people to do that and come up with some uh, pointers for people who don't start with a very high degree of self-belief as to how they might develop that. Um, another of those attitude things is high expectations. You know, just expecting a lot from other people as well as from yourself. It's very unusual. Uh, and there are some people in the book who make a whole career out of that, such as Jeff Bezos, who basically, every, his whole career has been based around this idea of high expectations for himself and for other people which doesn't make him an easy boss to work for. Steve Jobs is another uh, case in point. But these people expected the earth, and more than that, from their people, and somehow they managed to get it. Um, and if you couldn't meet those expectations, you were ruthlessly cut out of the team or the um, organisation. And uh, because people who have high expectations are quite unusual. And if you have someone in a team who doesn't share those high expectations, they can ruin the whole thing. Yeah, and, yeah. and likewise, if you get someone who is willing to adapt to what the team has in terms of high expectations, then they don't have to start with them. They basically fall into the culture and they, they adapt to it. But in a way, you want people who are uh, willing to go with the flow rather than everyone says, well, actually what you want is mavericks. Well, in some cases you do. But in many cases, that actually is poison. So that's another one of the, the attitudes. And I'll just, I'll just mention one of the others, which is thriving on mm. setbacks. The, the characteristic yeah. of nearly all of the 20 people that I identified was that they were failures. <laughs> they, were, they were complete failures in some cases. And, uh, mm. But somehow they managed to pick themselves up and, and have another go and have another go and have another go. And eventually they, they, they were successful. And it takes a certain sort of person to do that. And, but, but I'm also very interested in how you can actually develop that as a skill. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit related to one of, my, one of the people that I admire from a writing point, point of view uh, is the guy who wrote the book Anti-Fragile and Black Swan and, and all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah, great books. Yeah, yeah. and one of uh, Nassim Taleb's sort of, you know, key ideas 
is that you don't just want to be resilient, you actually want to be anti-fragile, which means that you like being broken in a way. It's, it's, it, he says that the, the excess energy generated from failure is often what causes success. And I think that's very, very true. Um, and the, the prime exhibit, exhibit A in this case, my lord, is actually Winston Churchill, who was a complete failure at just about everything for 40 years. And many times he was completely washed up. Uh, he ended up in the, in the late 1930s uh, in almost complete despair, completely isolated by his colleagues, uh, drinking very heavily, more, more heavily than, than even uh, his general um, uh, achievement. I, I love the quote from Churchill, which says, I have taken more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me. <laughs> uh, and he certainly lived by his, uh, his dictum there. Uh, but he was right about one thing uh, that nobody mm. else got right, which was Adolf Hitler was a, was a menace to the planet and had to be stopped before it was too late. And, uh, you know, he was warning what Hitler was doing, everyone else was saying, oh, no, 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 he's, he says he's got no more territorial ambitions, we can believe him, you know, we've been to talk to him, he's a quite reasonable chap, he's a vegetarian, he's, he's a wonderful chap. Uh, but, you know, Hitler knew what was, what was going to happen, and people remembered that in 1940, and when Britain was already at war, there was no choice, you know. If you wanted someone who was going to take on Hitler, there was only one person in the world who, who fit, fitted the job description. So Churchill, who was this guy who had monumental failures to his name, including, uh, you know, terrible military failures in, in the Dardanelles and, and earlier in the defence of Belgium in 1914. You know, this guy w was, you know, you wouldn't touch him with a barge pole, particularly yeah, in yeah. matters related to military affairs. Uh, he was... He was uh, you know, he basically antagonised the miners and helped to cause the general strike in 1926 and took a, a hugely unpleasant view of that. He alienated uh, organised labour. Uh, he resisted the giving of a relatively modest amount of self-government to India in the 1930s. He thought that Gandhi was was uh, not quite as bad as Hitler, but 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 a menace to the planet as well, you know. And the guy's judgment was awful. I mean, he was a fantastic orator, but but you know, everything everything came together in 1940, and no one else could probably have defeated Hitler. Uh, and that was a massive achievement for for a, a massive failure. So you know, that's that thriving on setbacks was almost the. The motif and had to be the motif because mm. even in the 1930s even when he was really really depressed Churchill still believed that he could stop Hitler and still believed mm. that had to be done and felt a you know a transcendent calm he says when he was appointed prime minister because he knew what he would he could that he could do it and that, and that nobody else could so that's another of the sort of attitude things and then from what I've read, yeah, sorry, no, go ahead, Richard. Well, one thing he absolutely had, Church, was the ability to rest and recover and just move himself away from things completely. And that's almost kind of like the art of meditation, isn't it? No, absolutely. Um, well, he also had the, 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 the common sense to, when he was sort of banging his head against a brick wall, to stop and then go do something different. So he was a military failure as a general in mm -hmm. 1914 in defending um, Antwerp. Uh, but when Antwerp had fallen to the uh, Germans, always the Germans, isn't it? When, when it had fallen to the Germans, yeah. um, he decided to get out of politics, uh, stop, stop being the, effectively the head of the Navy. Um, and he went to the trenches for six months. And <laughs> that, that seems a very counterintuitive thing to do. Mm. So he was, he was uh, I think he was a major, sort of not, not a particularly important person in, the, in it. And it just revived him. You know, he found the companionship, he found the, um, uh, just the unifying fact of, uh, which many people commented on, if they didn't get killed, they formed friendships which lasted for life because when you're under that kind of pressure, um, the other people alongside you are hugely important. He appreciated that, and, and it just revived him entirely. And then mm. 
in the in the uh, late 1920s he was excluded from the government and uh he was he he almost went bankrupt in after the wall street crash in 1929 and he had to keep ahead of his creditors well what he did was he went off and did a lecture tour in the united mm. states a grueling lecture tour it didn't go very well in some ways because he got run over by a car in Fifth Avenue in 1930 and he had quite serious injuries. Uh, right. But but he sort of, you know, he bounced back, as you said, he bounced back. He continued the tour. He got back to Britain bruised and battered a couple of years later. But, but nevertheless, he'd done something different and it had taken mm. his mind off the failures and he managed to stay ahead of his creditors as well. So, you know... It's just incredible that you know it's it's a good tactic. It, if 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 you have a disaster, go and do something different. That's my conclusion <laughs> from, from that one. Um, but anyway, I was going to say that, that there so there are some of these attributes which are questions of attitude, but not as conventionally defined. And then there are strategies that people do, and mm. many cases they just stumbled across these strategies. They weren't deliberate. They were reactions to events. And um, one of the strategies which was common, I discovered, to nearly all of the, my 20 people was at some stage in their life, they had what I called a transforming experience. A transforming experience meaning that they went into something which changed them, made them different. Uh, and it could be a company, it could be an experience uh, in one case, in a concentration camp, in another case, the hanging of an elder brother completely transformed the man who became Lenin. Um, mm. And uh, it's it's an experience which changes people and gives them some insight or some rare skill or some determination. And that uh, experience in business is very often going to work for a very unusual company which knows something that other people didn't know. And that was the case for me in my career. We were going to work for the Boston Consulting Group and for Bain and Company when strategy, business strategy, had just been invented. And, the, you know, these firms actually had a belief in the concepts that they used, particularly the gross share matrix, which I think is just a work of beauty and art and, and so on and so forth, yeah. that, on which I based the star principle and and various other strategies. One of the greatest books ever written, Richard, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Oz. I mean, I it's... To say that seriously. No, I think it is a very good book, but it's only a very good yeah. book because of the power of the concept, mm. uh, which says, basically, if you want to be successful as a, as a business, you've got to be dominant in your own particular market or niche, and you've got to be in a very high growth market. Well, you know, it doesn't take a genius to work out whether or not any individual business qualifies that and most of course don't but the few that do are going to be very very successful and you know it just amazes me that people i've got to say uh, it's made me personally quite successful in terms of the things i've endeavored to achieve um ha had a massive impact on my life and i think it should be on everyone's bookshelf actually so if people don't have it buy a copy now the star principle yes that's, thank you for the advertisement that's very kind of you <laughs> Um, but to back, go back to the transforming experience, mm. you know, people don't realise, for example, that Jeff Bezos went to work for D.E. Shore and Company, which was a hedge fund when he was 26 years old. He was, he'd, he'd been working on Wall Street, absolutely despised and disliked the horrible people mm. who were wor working in conventional investment banks. And um, a headhunter sent him to go and talk to David Shore, who'd started a sort of countercultural kind of um, investment organisation. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't sort of, you know, people didn't turn up to work in sort of sharp uh, suits and, and um, you know, pink shirts or anything like that. Mm. They came in jeans or shorts and T-shirts. And they, for the first three years of the life of D. Shore and Company, it was housed on top of a Marxist bookshop in the West Village. I mean, it was, it was, wow. it was, it was different. And, but the thing about it was, it was very highly quantitative. And uh, David Shaw had been a professor of finance somewhere. Uh, and 
they knew something that other people at that time, and this was the early and mid 19, sorry, 18, sorry, 1990s, uh, not very good at centuries, 1990s. <laughs> uh, and they knew that the internet was going to be massive and that it was going to be massive commercially, which other people just didn't realize in 1992 or 1993. And David Shaw and Jeff Bezos were kindred spirits. They were both off the scale bright. They were both introverts. They were both incredibly determined to be successful. And um, David Shaw and Bezos worked together on a project which they called the everything store. And the whole idea of it was that they would sell everything through the internet. And the first category that they would sell would be books. Now, you know, that's Amazon, you know, and, and basically David Shaw was going to start this business and wanted Bezos to be the head of this business within DE Shaw and company. Uh, but Bezos said, no, I actually want to go and do it myself. And quite amazingly, David Shaw let him go and do that. He didn't sue him. He you know, said, oh, good luck to you and all the rest of it. He took him for a walk in Central Park, tried to dissuade him and get him to do it within D. Shaw and company. But Jeff said, no, I want to do it myself. Started it in his garage and everyone, everyone knows what happened. But, but, you know, how extraordinary. If there had been no D.E. Shaw and company, there would have been no Amazon. You know, and and you and I would not have heard of Jeff Bezos. Unbelievably yeah. lucky in a sense, but unbelievably good in a, another sense because his formula, which was unbeatable prices and fantastic customer service, is what has defined Amazon. Makes it a very hard place to work, but mm. uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a jolly good idea, and a start business to boot. But but nevertheless. Um, you know, if he hadn't have had that experience, he wouldn't have been successful. And yeah. likewise, Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs achieved a great deal inventing the Macintosh and all the rest of it, but he got thrown out of his company. Again, you recognise some of these themes of a massive setback for a man who thought he was one of the enlightened ones. He'd started the bloody company, you know, and he got thrown out of it by effectively by someone who... Um, had worked for Pepsi and, you know, he thought of himself as a brilliant marketeer and he was a brilliant marketeer. But, but you know, basically he knew nothing about computers. He knew everything about fizzy drinks, you know. And so, you know, he was thrown out of his company. How did he get back? It, it, was, it was a series of accidents that happened in the 19, well, 1995, 1996, 1997. And mm. he just basically took a huge opportunity which presented itself to go back to Apple when Apple was about to go bankrupt. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can see that that was his transforming experience. It was those events that happened in the mid to, um, well, as I say, between 1995 and 1997, um, where he had founded a company which for reasons shouldn't have been successful but was very successful, which which then was bought by Apple and that brought him back into the fold. Um, anyway, that's, 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 that's a fascinating story and all the rest of it. But the point about transforming experience is not that, you know, these people set out to have transforming experiences. They, it, they happen by accident. For my readers, however, for anyone who's thinking about their career and does want to be unreasonably successful, mm. You have to have a transforming experience. There's no way around it. You know, you are not going to be exceptionally successful unless you have one. So if you, if you um, haven't had one, you've got to think about how to engineer that. And none right. of the people in my book engineered it, you know, planned, planned their transforming experiences, but readers can. So I hope that there'll be a lot more unreasonably successful people. And there are various other strategies which were followed by the people that than I describe in the book. Absolutely fantastic. So um, I was really excited about the book before, but now, you know, you've just blown it out of the water completely, Richard. So really looking forward to that. I just want to say that your newly launched podcast has been one of the most interesting and different on the web. If people haven't signed up to it already, it's available on YouTube and SoundCloud. Highly re recommend it. So Richard, you've been a delightful guest. 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Oz. Where do I send the cheque to? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, goodbye.